So if you have a spinner, that's fine. But sometimes um, what, what, what you can do is just you put a towel and you take your salad and you put it in. And let me, let me, let me show you, actually. This has been sort of dried, but you do like this. And if you don't have a spinner of your, and you just go like this. My grandmother used to do this. And you continue doing it until it's done, and then you put it in your bowl. OK, this is nice and dry. I have the, the pan going. It's a little hot. So I like nice sort of pieces. Some people like really small pieces of bacon. Some people like thick, like, like some of shoestring potatoes, you know, that kind of. Uh, I mean, whatever, whatever you know you you enjoy, but I like a nice piece of bacon when I when I bite into my salad. Yeah. This is a lot of bacon here. Let me just chew some off. Yeah, I think that's enough. Um, the mushroom just, if it's a little open, just sort of clean this. Uh, the, the stems uh, are not good for the salad unless they're really very tiny, but save them for something else. So if you have a towel like that and it's a little wet, which I did already, and you just clean them off like that, uh, the mushroom will be fine. When you're cutting, I mean, the simplicity, just keep your fingers away, get your knuckles towards the knife so that will sort of guide your knife not to go on your, on your finger. So always like that with the knife. Okay, let me put that right in here. Let's see how this is. I like the bacon crisp. And I want those sort of little caramelization in the dressing, but let me get rid of this excess fat here. I mean, you can leave a little bit, but I kind of like to do it this way, then just add a little bit of the oil. I'm gonna close the, okay, and Add the vinegar right in here. Okay, the dressing is just about ready. I just want to sort of uh, burn out a little bit of that um, intensity of the vinegar. Just let it come out. Let me salt the, the salad itself. All right. Okay, this. Looks good, all those little speckles. Mmm, oh. great. Now, of course, you dress the salad the last minute because it is a warm dressing and because, you know, salad wilts anyway. That's why you wait for the rollatini. Let me just put a little bit of fresh pepper. You know, this, this salad sort of fell out of favor, uh, but uh, 20 years ago, it used to be such a big seller in, in the restaurants. Um, and uh, I kind of, I really liked it. I really like it, and I still serve it in my restaurants, you know, some versions uh, of it. Um, I serve one like that with shrimps. Uh, and it really becomes almost, you know, like a meal, a lunch, uh, a full, full lunch meal. Mm. Now, the rollatini, as I was telling you, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sauce. You don't need sauce. Uh, it's crunchy. The cheese itself is really very oozy and tasty. Let's see, which one do I want? Mm. One, two, 
to, okay, I think that's enough for the portion. So I think what I would do is I would have a nice meal just like this. So here I am again at the difficult chore of tasting for you. But this looks wonderful. All right. Mm -mm. I want to, let's see, I wanted to show you how it looks. It's moist and uh, it, it, the veal really remains moist. You think that sometimes, you know, just like this dry would dry out, but it doesn't. It really doesn't. Mm. <clears throat> I'm enjoying it. And some spinach salad. Mm. It goes very well together. Good. The spinach salad, I like my spinach salad just with a little extra acidity. I know you're not supposed to talk with your mouth full, but I've got to convey to you as it happens. Um, I like a little acidity in my spinach salad, so a little extra because of the bacon. And together, really, really goes wonderful. And of course, a little sip of vino makes it all complete. Now, to make it complete, you would think dessert. But you know, Italians are not big dessert eaters. So I'm going to show you how to make a cookie, a pignoli uh, almond paste cookie, very typical in Sicily specifically, where the almonds are the best. Uh, and that's going to be just the perfect ending to this dish. Pignoli cookies, biscotti di pignoli, uh, wonderful cookies. Everybody, you, you, you've had them. You've, every Italian bakery has them. It's those little sort of rounds with all the pignoli nuts. And these are the pignoli nuts all over it. It's great because it's a cookie that's a flourless cookie. So uh, what you need is almond paste to begin with. And I'm just opening a can of almond paste here. I opened both sides and I'm just going to press it right out into the processor. Now these things are good. You know, you know what, what you can use them for if you make raviolis or if you're cutting pasta? They make great like cookie cutters. Just, and, and it's nice because you have, you know, really some, something to, to, so when you're making those ravioli or whatever, or even cookies, they're great like this. Let me just break. So this is almond paste. Uh, it's just sugar and ground almonds and uh, some, some egg whites. And the cookies ultimately are flourless. And they take an abundant amount of sugar, but that's, I guess, what makes them good. Egg whites, not the yolks. Save the yolks to make that pasta. And you have the can to cut the, the ravioli. So you're all ready to go. Uh, there's nothing major happening in that you really have to work, but you do have to sort of blend in completely the sugar and the egg whites. And the mixture will be a little sticky at the end. Okay, okay. Yeah. Let me just, you could work it right out of here, but given the blade, let me just pull it out. ready to shape them. Make yourself a plate of the pignoli, just spread them out. You don't have to, usually pignoli or any nuts that you work with when baking are toasted, but in this case, they'll toast on top of the cookie. So, so just a little bit of wet water and you shape them. And 
make it in a ball. I want not too big in a ball. Just roll the ball right into the pignoli nuts. You just set them on a baking sheet lined with paper, parchment paper. And let me just put a little bit more. Make them all the same size. Now, they'll bake about 15 minutes in 350 degree oven. I like mine chewy uh, because, you know, there's no flour. There's not really much that needs cooking. The macaroon, the macaroon is chewy is very good and I like them that way. If you like them crunchy and hard, then just lower the temperature a little bit, make it 300 and extend the baking time a little bit, maybe 10 more minutes or so. And then you just sort of just lightly roll them because otherwise they'll fill themselves up with pignoli and you'll get too many pignolis. They spread out a little bit, so in the line of three, just a little bit of water. Okay, so let me finish this one. Okay, we finished the first tray, and you can continue making uh, the rest, but we'll put it in the oven, a hot oven, and again, 350 degrees, and not too long, 15 minutes, and they become delicious and chewy, and that's the way I like them. Well, the cookies are baked and they have cooled off. And you know, at my house, there's always so many people, but today it's just you and me. And I'm just gonna sit down and relax, enjoy my rollatini, and then have one of these wonderful cookies. And I told you how I like them nice and chewy and exactly as they are. Wonderful. Well, I'm gonna set them down and, you know, what do we say at my house? Tutti a tavola a mangiare. But it's not tavola today. You're in my kitchen, so tutti nella mia cucina a mangiare. Mussels grilled in pine needles, an outrageous technique for a favorite French shellfish. Salmon on a stick, a Native American classic, roasted on redwood steaks over an open fire. Caveman T-bones, grilling doesn't get much more primal than this. From the beautiful Esplendor Resort in Southern Arizona, I'm Stephen Reichlet. Primal Grill is about to get a lot more primal. Before pots and pans, before smokers and grills, there was fire. Today, we dig deep into barbecue's roots. Open pit grilling, grilling in pine needles, grilling on the embers. You know, I'm absolutely crazy about these primal grilling techniques. Grilling on a stick, grilling in the embers, it's all about the connection. This is where cooking began. This is where mankind began. What if I told you that one of the best dishes I ever tasted on Planet Barbecue contained only one ingredient? That it used a fuel you find in forests and parks everywhere, and a grilling technique unique in the annals of barbecue. The French call it éclat de moule, and I call it one of the best ways there is 
to cook mussels. The mussel is a black shell bivalve, particularly prized on the west coast of France. When working with mussels, first, if you see any with partially open shells, tap them on the cutting board. If the shell closes, you know the mussel is still alive and safe to eat. If the mussel shell stays open, discard it. Cardinal rule with any shellfish, when in doubt, throw it out. The next thing to look for is the beard. It's a cluster of fibers the mussel uses to cling to the rocks. And if the mussel has a beard, grab it with needle nose pliers and pull it out. At the restaurant La Bouvette on the Ile de Ré, an island off the west coast of France, they actually use a cast iron skillet with holes in it, the sort you would use for roasting chestnuts. If you don't have one, you can make a hold pan. Simply poke a series of holes in the bottom of the pan with a knife and twist to make holes about a half an inch in diameter. Obviously, this is not a great thing to do to the blade of a knife you use every day. Once you have perforated the bottom of the pan, loosely fill it with dry pine needles. And you want to sort of feather the pine needles. That way, they'll catch fire more easily. It's important that the pine needles be dry. Now, take the mussels and lay them on top of the pine needles. And you want them fairly sparsely spread, about one pound of mussels per person. And that's all there is to it. Now the grill. We're working on a charcoal grill, but you can also cook the mussels on a gas grill. When working with charcoal, I like to use natural lump charcoal. You can see the shape of the original branch. And what you do is light it in a chimney starter, place either a piece of crumpled newspaper or a paraffin fire starter in the bottom, light it on the grill. Beauty of a chimney starter, the shape funnels the heat upward so the coals light evenly without having to use petroleum-based fire starter. And here's a chimney I lit earlier. So simply dump out the coals and rake the coals into a mound in the center of the grill. You want a hot fire. Then place the grill grate on top of the grill, and you're ready for business. Then place the mussels on the grill directly over the charcoal, and they'll start to smoke almost instantly. What you want to do is you want the pine needles to catch fire, and it's in this flash of blazing pine needles that the mussels cook. The pine needles give the mussels an incredible piney smoke flavor. And if you need to, you can help the flaming process along by hitting the mussels with a butane lighter. And once the pine needles flame, cover the mussels with another foil pan. That holds in the heat and smoke. Cooking time is really quick, five to eight minutes, or just until the mussel shells open. The beauty of this dish, you serve the mussels right in the pan with the burnt pine needles, and you eat it with your bare fingers. You take one. Mmm, oh my god, smoked mussels with that piney flavor, unbelievable. And here's how they do it in France. You take one set of empty mussel shells and then use them kind of as tongs, and you eat another, and another. Mussels grilled on a bed of pine needles, because sometimes grilling is best when it's at its most simple. When the first Europeans arrived in the New World, they found a highly developed tradition of live fire cooking. Barbacoa in the Caribbean, clam bakes in New England, luau's in Hawaii, and of course the great salmon roasts in the Pacific Northwest and California. That's the inspiration for our next dish, salmon roasted on redwood steaks in front of an open fire. 
To be strictly authentic, you'd use wild salmon from the Pacific, either king or coho. And ideally, it would come with the skin attached. Take the salmon and cut it crosswise into sections about three inches wide. This salmon has had the pin bones removed, but you can just run your fingers over the fillets, and if you feel any bones, pull them out with a needle-nosed pliers. Next, make a series of starter holes through the salmon skin. There are two reasons I like salmon with the skin one. First of all, the skin helps the fish hold together on the steaks. Second of all, I love the crunchy taste of grilled salmon skin. Next, make the rub. It starts with freshly ground black pepper, coarse sea salt, and our primal grill twist, which pays homage to our Southwest Arizona location. These are sawado cactus seeds. They've got a nice crunch and a mild nutty flavor. So add these to the salt and pepper mixture. Mix the rub with your fingertips. Season the salmon on both sides with the cactus seed rub. If you can't find serrato cactus seeds, use poppy seeds or sesame seeds. The serrato cactus is an iconic symbol of the Sonoran Desert, where we're taping Primal Grill. Just rub the seasonings into the fish. Take a piece of salmon and thread the narrow end of the redwood stake through the starter hole, out the other end, and then just sort of curl back through the middle starter hole and finally out the other side and slide the fish to the end of the stake. Do the same with the second piece of salmon. Now let me show you the fire. To cook the salmon on a stick, we have built a long, slender fire pit. Now, this shape is great because it helps localize the fire. Ring of stones on the outside, hardwood fire on the inside. Earlier today, we made a series of holes in the ground right behind the fire pit. And you just want to stand the salmon on its redwood stakes in front of the fire. Cooking time is about 30 minutes in all, 15 minutes on each side. You'll watch as the fish cooks and turn it around skin side to the fire when you need to. Another ingenious thing about this method, the self-basting process. As the salmon fat melts, and salmon is a very fatty fish, it drips down the fish, bastes it, and keeps it moist. Really simple, just spectacular to look at. The flavors are gonna be out of this world. And from time to time, you can put fresh logs on the fire. You really want to cook next to the embers, not next to a raging fire. The traditional wood for a Yurok salmon roast is madrone, sometimes called madrone. It's a hard, fragrant wood from Northern California in the Pacific Northwest. You've got the wood fire. You've got the flavor from the redwood steaks, the smoke. You really don't need a lot of seasoning. Turn the fish from time to time so it browns evenly on both sides. It smells really nice. The salmon looks cooked and it looks beautiful. The way you check it is to give it what I call the flake test. You kind of pinch a little bit and it will break into clean flakes. Mm, yum. And here's the salmon, hot off the fire. You can really smell the wood smoke. Okay, let's take a piece. 
Look how easily it slides off the stick. A little lemon. Mmm. Wow. Utterly simple and utterly great. That salmon is so moist, and you get the little nutty crunch of the cactus seed. Salmon roasted in front of an open fire from the Klamath River, the Primal Grill. Got it? All right. It's amazing how much work goes into a show. And I wanted people to see that. I wanted people to really understand what goes into making Primal Grill. Bread may not be the first thing you think of grilling, but it was certainly one of the first foods man learned to cook with live fire. Italian bruschetta, Middle Eastern pita, and Indian naan all owe their soulful flavor to the proximity of fire and smoke. Up next, a not-so-simple garlic bread you grill directly over a campfire. Start with loaves of Italian-style bread and cut them in half using a serrated knife. Next, make the garlic parsley butter. It starts with creamed salted butter, then add pepper, finely chopped garlic, chopped fresh flat leaf parsley, grated Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese, and here's the kicker, finely chopped prosciutto. Beat these ingredients together until the mixture is light and creamy. You can see why it's important to have the butter at room temperature. Next, spread the garlic, parsley, cheese, prosciutto butter on the cut side of each piece of bread. The flavorings for this bread, of course, are limited only by your imagination. For a Mexican twist, you could use chopped jalapeno chilies and cilantro. I love the addition of the prosciutto. There are a couple of options for grill baskets. This model is designed for a half loaf, and this model accommodates a full loaf. What you do is, using an oil sprayer, spray the basket with olive oil. This will keep the garlic bread from sticking. All you need to do at this point is place the garlic bread half in the basket. Then slide the ring back to secure it. I'll show you again. Ring down to open the basket. Half garlic bread. Slide the ring down to secure it. With this basket, open up the hinge panels and the flexible wire will bend to accommodate the bread. Close the basket with this ring. The garlic breads are ready for grilling. Let's head over to the fire. So when I said wood grilled garlic bread, I meant it. And what you want to do is just use your live fire as a toaster get more of a kind of a smoke flavor, you go over the flames, and more just grilling, you go over the coals. And if it gets too hot, put on your grill gloves, and you can go back over the heat. Remember, the grill was the original toaster. You've probably heard of a popular Italian appetizer called bruschetta. It comes from the Italian word bruscare, meaning to burn. Of course, what we want to do is grill the garlic bread, not burn it. And that's what you're looking for, the golden brown edges and the sizzling, bubbling butter. And here's your grilled garlic bread. And what you want to do when you take it out, remember, this metal ring will be very hot. So use a glove to pull it out, and then you just kind of shake to loosen the bread from the basket.
can't wait to try this. Mmm! The wood fire gives the bread a really rustic quality, and the prosciutto and parmesan take this to a whole other level. Garlic bread grilled over a campfire, all in a day's work on Primal Grill. You got it. Thank All right. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Long before there were grill grates or even barbecue grills, there was live fire cooking. I give you our most primal steak yet, the caveman T-bone. You don't even need a grill grate. The T-bone is my favorite steak. It's actually two steaks in one, a New York strip and a filet mignon connected by a T-shaped bone. Step number one, season the steaks generously on both sides with coarse salt and freshly ground or cracked black pepper. Why am I such a fanatic about coarse salt? Because the crystals dissolve more slowly than table salt. So when you bite into the steak, you get a crunchy burst of salty flavor. Let me show you the fire. I'm working over natural lump charcoal, which I've lit in a chimney starter. Dump the coals on the bottom grate of your grill, and you must use natural lump charcoal. Spread the coals out into an even layer on the bottom of your grill grate, leaving about one third of the grill cold free. This is your cool or safety zone, and believe me, you'll need it. Next, fan any loose ash off of the coals. And now, the really cool part. Take your T-bones and check these out. These are a full two inch thick, and lay them directly on the coals. Hey, I told you these were caveman T-bones. So what's the advantage of cooking the T-bones directly on the coals? Well, besides the obvious shock value, you get a surface charring, a crust, and a smoke flavor you just can't achieve on a conventional grill. And how do you know when it's time to turn the steaks? Well, first of all, you'll see a little blood pearl up on the top of the steak. And then look at the bottom. When it's crusty and dark brown, the steaks are ready to turn. Once the steaks are cooked and browned on both sides, what you want to do is lift them up and tap each steak to knock off any loose embers. See, there's a loose ember. You want to knock that off. And with a pastry brush, you can brush off any loose ash. There won't be much. Now, you never want to cut into a steak hot off the grill or the coals. You always want to let it rest for a few minutes so the meat will relax, become more juicy. So, Loosely cover the steaks with aluminum foil. And now the fire-roasted pepper sauce. Break the coals into an even layer and pour about a half cup of extra virgin olive oil into a cast iron skillet. Then set the skillet directly on the coals to heat for a couple of minutes. When the oil is hot, add thinly slivered yellow bell pepper, red bell pepper, flat leaf parsley, and thinly sliced garlic. Return the mixture to the heat. Cook the peppers until lightly brown and fragrant and aromatic, two to three minutes. 
Was I nervous the first time I threw an expensive T-bone steak uh, on a bed of embers? You bet I was. But the flavor was so amazing, the presentation so cool, I had to take a chance and try it. So the T-bones have rested. Pour your flame-roasted peppers over the steak. And you want to use a really thick glove. This is extremely hot. So there it is. Caveman T-bone with flame-roasted pepper sauce. And I can't wait to dive in. Look at that, the way I like it. Mm. The smoky crust, the garlicky peppers. This might be the best steak on Planet Barbecue. So unleash your inner caveman. Primal mussels, primal salmon, garlic bread grilled over a campfire, and primal T-bone. Follow your primal instincts. See you next time. Light it in a chimney starter. Uh, you place either a piece of crumpled newspaper. That's what you're looking for, the golden brown edge and the sizzling bubble. And if it gets too hot, just back off the fire. I think I'm going to say the, um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bum, the, uh, Shrimp grilled on sugar cane, sweet, smoky, and spiked with rum. Jamaican jerk chicken, Jamaica's claim to barbecue fame. Buccaneer baby bags, fire and spice from the West Indies. From the historic Esplendor Resort in Southern Arizona, I'm Stephen Reichlet. Today we tackle the Caribbean, barbecue's birthplace. know the Caribbean as a hotbed of primal grilling. What you may not know is that it was here that the Taino Indians developed a unique wooden grill called a barbacoa. Yes, that's the origin of our word barbecue. Today on Primal Grill, barbecue's birthplace, the Caribbean. You need the knife, please, and that small whisk, please. Many countries have vast grilling repertoires. Jamaica's claim to barbecue fame lies in a single dish, jerk. Perfected by runaway slaves in the 18th century, jerk consists of a fiery paste of scotch bonnet chilies and allspice. You're probably familiar with jerk pork. Here's a lesser known jerk chicken from the town of Yalas. And it begins with the jerk seasoning. Start with one bunch of scallions cut into one inch pieces. Then a couple of shallots, finely chopped garlic, and as much fiery scotch bonnet chili as you can bear. Next, fresh thyme, salt, freshly ground black pepper, allspice, and puree these ingredients together in a food processor. Once pureed, add a little vegetable oil and enough water to obtain a thick but pourable seasoning. People say that the Scotch bonnet is the world's hottest chili. Well, many of you have written to let me know that there are hotter chilies in India, but I will tell you, this is one of the hottest. 200 
1,000 Scovilles. That's a measure of heat. Regular jalapeno has about 5,000 Scovilles. So we're talking hot. I'm using chicken legs. Most grill masters prefer chicken uh, legs, the dark meat. It's fatter, it's richer, it's less expensive than the breast. Yes, the jerk seasoning has scotch bonnets, but it's really uh, as much about the sweetness of the allspice and the fragrance of the thyme. That's really the essence of jerk seasoning. Okay, and what you can do just to finish up here is a little fresh thyme and allspice berries on top. Refrigerate for at least four hours or as long as overnight. The longer, the richer the flavor. Jerk is associated the, with the Maroons, who were runaway slaves that gathered on the south coast of uh, Jamaica. And they had villages in the deep, impenetrable highlands. Uh, jerking was a process of uh, preserving meat in fiery chilies and spices, and then smoke roasting the meat over pimiento, allspice wood. Next, the fuel. Now, in Yalas, they would use natural lump charcoal. Uh, you can see by the jagged shape that this actually really came from a tree. You light the charcoal in a chimney starter uh, like this one. You can use either crumpled newspaper or a paraffin starter to light the charcoal. Beauty of a chimney, it conducts the heat upwards so you don't need lighter fluid. In Jamaica, they cook the chicken in a 55-gallon steel drum. I'm using a Kamado cooker. This is a ceramic cooker. Among its features, thick ceramic walls, which are great for holding the heat, uh, a very well-designed venting system that enables you to go from very low heat to a very high heat in a matter of minutes. We have a bed of charcoal on the bottom. And in order to smoke the jerk chicken, we're going to add a handful of hardwood chips. And in Jamaica, they would use allspice wood. It's called pimiento. So we can add a handful of allspice berries to replicate the effect. Next, place the grate on the grill. Take the chicken. You can see I've had it over ice for safety. And simply arrange the chicken pieces on the grate. So where does the word jerk come from? One theory is that it is a Jamaican Patois word, juke, meaning to stab or poke, because traditionally people would poke holes in the chicken to help the marinade penetrate more quickly. Another theory is that it comes from a South American Indian word called charqui or sharky, as in our jerky, a process of smoke drying and curing the meat. It's a good idea to have the skin side up. That way, the melting fat uh, will base the uh, jerk chicken. Close the lid of the cooker. You want to adjust the vent holes to obtain a temperature of about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Cooking time, 40 to 60 minutes. Next, let me show you how to make the hellish relish. It starts with distilled white vinegar and salt. And you simply want to whisk the mixture until the salt dissolves. Then add thinly sliced scotch bonnet chilies and thinly sliced onion. And the chilies, of course, are what make the relish hellish. Let this mixture marinate for at least 30 minutes. Uh, it's sort of a pickle. It will actually keep for several days. All right, let's check the chicken. Swap out. Let's put the new guys out. It looks great, but as always with poultry, you want to use an instant read meat thermometer to check for doneness. You're looking for between 165 and 170 degrees. Bingo.
take the jerk chicken to a platter, which I've lined with uh, a banana leaf, in keeping with the island theme. Here's your jerk chicken. Just spoon a little of the hellish relish over it. And let's see how we did. Mmm, really nice, man. Good heat, smoky meat. Makes you hungry for the Caribbean. Harry, there you go, sir. Um, I will find a pen. Um, Patrick, will you grab the shrimp? Need a cutting board, guys? We need this one, a pan of ice. The idea of grilling shrimp on sugar cane actually comes from Southeast Asia. There's a traditional uh, Vietnamese dish uh, where you take shrimp mousse and uh, mold it onto sugar cane and grill it. Sugar cane has fueled the Caribbean economy for centuries as a sweetener and as an ingredient for rum. I think you'll love the way the cane sweetens the shellfish from the inside out. Step number one, the glaze. It starts with eight tablespoons of salted butter, one half cup brown sugar, Dijon mustard, cinnamon, and cloves for a tropical flavor distilled white vinegar, and a generous splash of rum. OK, and you want to simmer these ingredients on the stove or on the side burner of your grill. Cook the sauce until thick and richly flavored, whisking from time to time. Cooking time about five to eight minutes. Let me show you how to put together the shrimp. Now, these are sugarcane swizzle sticks. They're sticks cut from whole sugarcane. You can buy them packaged at most supermarkets. And what you want to do is you want to cut off one edge here to make a sharp point. What you do on the shrimp, you make a starter hole using a metal or bamboo skewer. You just want to twist it a couple times to kind of widen that hole. And then insert the sugar cane, pointy end first, through the shrimp. These shrimp, by the way, are U10s. That means there are 10 shrimp to a pound. They are what we would call jumbo shrimp. They've been peeled and deveined. And next thing you want to do is oil, salt, and pepper the shrimp little extra virgin olive oil. We'll brush the tops of the shrimp. Now, sugar cane is actually not native to the Caribbean. It was brought there by Christopher Columbus on his historic voyage. Became a very important staple, both as a sweetener and as an ingredient for a new distilled beverage. The European settlers craved wine and brandy, but grapes wouldn't grow in the Caribbean. So they decided to still fermented sugarcane juice. The Latin word for sugarcane is saccharum. It was shortened to a beverage we all love, rum. OK, we have one more preparation, an aluminum foil grill shield. Fold your aluminum foil in three like a business letter. And you want the shiny side out so it will reflect the heat. OK, let's set up the grill. And while we're back here, let's just give a whisk to our glaze, which has uh, thickened into a luscious sauce. Grill preheated to high. You'll remember the grill master's mantra, keep it hot. One Caribbean, two Caribbean, ouch. Keep it clean with a few swipes. 
of our wire drill brush and keep it lubricated or oiled. And here is a cool technique. Take a half an onion, dip it in oil, and rub it across the bars of the grate. Take your grill shields and you want to lay them along the front of the grill. And that way, when you put the shrimp on the grill, it will keep the sugarcane skewers from burning. Put a second row on the grill, and the shrimp in the first row will act as a shield. Cooking time is quick, about two to three minutes per side. Turn the shrimp over. By the way, if you wanted to give this recipe a Southeast Asian accent, you could use stalks of lemongrass instead of sugarcane. Or for an Italian accent, use sprigs of rosemary. The important thing to learn here is the idea of using a flavored skewer. Baste the shrimp with this rum brown sugar glaze. And I actually like to cook the glaze right into the shrimp on the grill. And the way you tell the shrimp are done, well, first of all, the poke test, they feel firm to the touch. You can see by the color. Take the shrimp off. And I'm going to start in the middle here. Remember, the shrimp in the center cooks a little more quickly than the edges, so we'll give these guys on the edges just a few more minutes. And if they get a little bit too hot, you can certainly use a set of tongs to take the shrimp off. Just to finish up, what you can do is just take a little bit of this sauce and ladle it over the shrimp. It's a really nice sauce, kind of sweet with the mustard and vinegar to balance the sugar. And then any leftover sauce can go into a bowl to serve with the shrimp for dipping. A little cilantro kind of reinforce that Caribbean flavor. And there you have it, shrimp grilled on sugar cane with a mustard rum brown sugar sauce. Let's see how we did. Mm. This is really nice. The shrimp has a great smoky flavor and the rum comes through. And best of all, you kind of, you bite it and you get that little squirt of sugar cane juice. It's the quintessential taste of the Caribbean. To the crew, I just want to let you know there's another batch for you all to try that doesn't have a bite out of each shrimp. The making of a show like Primal Grill may seem easy when you watch it uh, on your screen, but an enormous amount of work goes into it. And uh, I wanted people to see the work that goes into it, to see how we prep the food, how we keep the fires burning. Uh, it's sort of a, a major organizational and uh, lo logistical challenge. In the 17th century, French pirates gathered on the north coast of Haiti, where they took to smoking meats like the natives. The local word for smoke was boucan, and the pirates became known as buccaneers. That's the origin of our last dish, buccaneer baby backs. As with so many dishes on Primal Grill, it begins with a rub. Start with coarse salt, brown sugar, black pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, ground cinnamon, and ground cloves for a tropical flavor, cayenne pepper or hot paprika. Mix the ingredients with your fingers to break up any lumps that may be in the brown sugar. For the rib, I'm using a baby back. It's a rib that's cut Right next to the backbone, we have an expression in American barbecue. We say eating high off the hog. These ribs are the most tender and the best marbles. What you want to do is sprinkle the rub over the ribs. 
and rub the spices into the meat. If you're a newcomer, baby backs are great ribs. They're very tender and they cook quickly. And the cloves and the cinnamon really give these ribs a nice tropical aroma. These baby back ribs came peeled. If there's a skin on, you just pry it off with the probe of your Instant Read meat thermometer. And if you want to cook a number of racks of ribs in a small space, you can stand them upright in a rib rack. When you place the ribs in the rib rack, you want the fat part of the ribs upwards that way. As the ribs cook, the melting fat will base the meat. Now the grill. We're working over charcoal. It's much easier to smoke on a charcoal grill than a gas grill. And I've lit natural lump charcoal in a chimney starter. What you want to do is set the grill up for indirect grilling. That means dumping the coals into these side baskets and leaving the center of the grill open. Now take a couple of aluminum foil pans and place them in the bottom of the grill. The foil pans actually serve two purposes. First, they catch the dripping fat from the ribs, and second of all, they force you to have an indirect grilling setup. Simply grab the ribs, place them on the grill directly over the drip pan away from the heat, and then to generate smoke, place a good tongue full on each mound of coal. Cover the grill, and you want to position the vents so that it's between the two mounds of coals. That way, the smoke will be drawn up evenly. Cook at a temperature of about 325 to 350 degrees. Yeah, I know that's a little bit hotter than the low, slow method used for spare ribs, but with baby backs, I like to work at a higher heat. The meat comes out a little bit more crisp. The next step is to make the pineapple spray glaze. Start with pineapple juice. To it, add dry white wine, rum, and Worcestershire sauce. And the cool thing here is that we'll place the spray glaze in a spray bottle and spray it directly on the ribs. Pineapple is native to the New World. It was one of the first fruits brought by Columbus back to Spain. OK, and then simply attach the sprayer. Good. Now, the ribs have been cooking for about 30 minutes. And what you want to do is just spray the ribs with this pineapple mixture. And what this does is helps keep the ribs moist and adds an extra layer of flavor. We'll cover the ribs and cook for another 30 to 40 minutes. And they look beautiful. And the way you check for doneness is you actually look at the ends of the bones. You can see the meat has shrunk back by about a quarter of an inch. That tells you the ribs are ready. I'm going to do one final preparation here. And that is I'm going to place the ribs directly over the fire and baste with a little bit of our pineapple rum barbecue sauce. The idea is that you actually sear the sauce right into the meat. The recipe for the sauce is on our website. One very common mistake in cooking ribs is to put the sauce on too early. Remember, most barbecue sauces contain sugar, and the sugar will burn. So if you put the barbecue sauce on, do it right at the end. So here are the Buccaneer baby backs. Another test. They'll be tender enough to pull apart with your finger. You just cut the ribs into three or four bone sections. Arrange them on a platter, just like the Buccaneers would have done. We have nailed these. Mm.
that smoke and fruit flavor is really nice. So there you have it. Shrimp grilled on sugar cane, Jamaican jerk chicken, and Buccaneer baby bags from the birthplace of barbecue on Primal Grill. <laughs>